A long, long time ago, before I discovered the teleprompter, I said if someone sent me a tabletop CNC, we would make our own circuit boards. Give me $2,500 and I'll do it on video. I fudged the line because I didn't have a teleprompter. The point is, my bluff has been called. Today's challenge, can we make circuit boards right here as fast as we could 3D print a Benchy? It's gonna be a grind, but you know the drill. I'll put up the title card, I'm still doing a bit. Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, welcome to the corner of Voidstar Lab. There seems to be some sort of large contraption blocking the spot where I usually put the camera, so get used to our new backdrop. Before YouTube, almost all of my projects were electronics. Circuits played lead guitar, code was the vocals, and the 3D printer was just the lowly bassist. No, worse, the drummer. My pigeon is now wedged in a 3D printed hole because every time I do electronics for a video, it ruins everything. See, I can start a 3D print almost instantly, anytime, get the results, fix the mistakes, lather, rinse, repeat 24-7, 365. But the Mirage Mechanical Keyboard and my other electronics projects stall out when I have to design and order boards. I only have like a week to make each project, so if I lose only a single business day per iteration, it's straight up impossible to finish on time. I should just do next month's boards while I finish this month's video, but my ADHD having man-child brain has never shown any ability to actually have that level of productivity. Judge me all you want, but if we're gonna make circuits and stay in a ruthless algorithm's good graces, we're gonna need subtractive manufacturing. Can we prototype boards whenever we want with robotic precision, just like a 3D printer? And can that actually be a 3D printer so uh, we don't alienate my terrifyingly specific audience? Also, if it's a laser cutter, I'm not gonna complain. Everything's better with a frickin' laser. Behold the Snapmaker 2.0 A350, provided by today's sponsor, I forgot. Snapmaker's strength is their attention to detail. This is the slickest, most handsome 3D printer I have ever touched, and everything from the accordion doors to the mirror-polished bezel to the power supply's softly throbbing white light just drips with engineering prestige. Unscrew the extruder, install the laser, and you can slather on 1600 milliwatts of coherent photonic gravy. Swap in the CNC spindle and tear through wood, plastic, and most importantly for today, fiberglass. These aren't accessories either. All three tool heads and their accoutre maw come right there in the box. I'm at the 3D printer. I'm at the laser engraver. I'm at the combination 3D laser printer CNC engraver router machine printer. CNC routing is a filthy business, especially when you're using fiberglass boards that will explode into glass fibers upon the slightest caress. To contain the caress mess, they sent me a smart enclosure with a built-in light and an exhaust port that I spiffed up with a 3D printed dust sucking hosey boy, technical term. Fiberglass dust is basically pure cancer, so everything here is a HEPA filter and I set my air purifier to turbo! Today's test subject is from my very second video, the Super Advanced Nerf Rapid Strike. In a master stroke of taste, I named this motor driver board the Hot Beef Injection. Pourquoi? Well, phallic references are kind of like a running joke in the Nerf internet community, so I figured that, oh, you mean, why am I recycling a five-year-old project instead of starting a new one? I designed the HBI to etch myself, so it has plump traces, wide spaces, oversized footprints, and it should generally make it practical to mill with without having any skill. What do you think, I'm gonna learn the CNC in one week and have time to make a whole new board from start to finish? What part of my work ethic sucks are you having trouble with? Here's the play. Prep the stuff, drill the holes, engrave the top, flip the board, engrave the bottom, mill the outline, make the rest of the board easy peasy CNCZ. We could add solder mask and silk screen, but let's just save that for a future episode, he said promising value to potential subscribers. But Zack, I hear you say, you are clearly an ignorant, low IQ, engineering, valor stealing, click baiting, scrub lord rat pube headed sentient penis, since you clearly have never heard of phenolic circuit boards, nor etching copper. If I exhaustively justified everything I did here, this video would be boring. Er. But if you must set me straight in the comment section, kindly remember to use small words.
This means we're not actually making PCBs. We're not printing circuits on boards and etching away the rest, and we're certainly not going to 3D print circuit boards. This is conductive filament, and its resistance is 15 billion times higher than copper. So a 3D printed circuit board is as worthless as a YouTuber struggling to find a metaphor. The Snapmaker has a standard ER11 collet, which puts a smorgasbord of different tools at our disposal. We have lots of different settings to tune, we have lots of different methods to try, so success or failure is going to come down to my two best friends, trial and error. Professional CNC's have a robotic tool changer with a rack of bits so they can automatically mill edges, score snap points, and drill holes all in a single job. We have multiple tools and a tool changer as well, except the tool changer's me! Robots stealing our jobs, Brooke. First, we gotta make our own slot board because we're about to do some naughty things to it. MDF, medium density fiber board, is great for this since it doesn't warp, it's consistent, and it's gentle on the bits, hey -oh. I over-engineered this jig to drill mounting holes so I could bolt this thing over the Snapmaker's thinner, stupider slot board. Then I realized I'm an idiot. I made another jig and I replaced the Snapmaker slot board. Why did I make it vomit camo instead of printing it in one piece on the Snapmaker itself? Four printers are faster than one. I really cannot express how quickly I have to make projects. Let's load up an end mill, let's hit home, and god damn it, first bit down. So let's go to Micro Center and grab some replacements. See, the machine doesn't know the length of my tool, nor the thickness of my work surface. So it'll eagerly try to plow the business end right into the bed full force. If I were one of those peck sniffy and panty wastes of 3D printing, I'd put down my avocado toast and reach for the mesh leveling. But we're riding the CNC highway, brother, so let's crank that hog and mill a rectangle right into the slop board's stupid face. That's right, you don't level the bed, you mill a level surface into the bed. It's called facing, and it's so dumb. Yet so smart. MDF is compressed sawdust, by the way, so this is like kicking a bag of flour. Shall we use Snapmaker's beautifully designed anodized aluminum clamps to attach our circuit boards to our slop board? No! After freeing our copper clad from the Oriental Daily News, it's propagandastic. You think Oriental will get us demonetized? Because the newspaper is called the Oriental Daily News, like I even looked it up. We apply a foot of double-sided tape strong enough to nail down an area rug and plaster that sh straight to the bed. How do we plan to get it off the bed? We don't plan, that's what got us into this in the first place. We kick it down the road and make Future Zack deal with it. To put our chips on the board, that's two puns, baby. We have to convert our PCB to CNC jobs. Luckily, there's a free open source solution called FlatCam that does exactly this. Unluckily, it's crammed with bizarre gotchas, insane workflows, and the performance is terrible. It's also laid abandoned for like six years. Basically, it's Team Fortress 2. Alright, that's not fair. Flatcam was made by one extremely dedicated dude in his free time, but TF2 is botched by America's most profitable company per employee. Plus, when Flatcam works, it's really useful, but when TF2 works, it's a coincidence. We're making a double-sided board, and allow me to get technical for a second. That means it's got stuff on both sides. Unless the top and bottom layers are perfectly aligned or registered, drill hits are going to miss their marks and cut into the traces, ruin everything. But with the CNC, we can cheat. We can have it mill symmetrical holes through the copper clad and deep into the slot board so when we're done with the top layer, we can flip the board over, pin it down with some steel dowels, and the bottom copper is guaranteed to line up with the top. Flatcam does this for us, but it won't warn us if we put the alignment pegs too close and the spindle's gonna send them into low earth orbit. Why would it? Zach from the future here, it just dawned on me that after the alignment pins have served their purpose, you're supposed to remove them from the board so the CNC doesn't whack into them. Don't judge me. We import the top and bottom Gerbers, generate the alignment hole drilling job, from which we generate the alignment hole milling job, from which we generate the alignment hole CNC job, which we export to a G-code file and import into Snapmaker Lubon to send on to the CNC. This is... Lubon version 4.1, so close to Lubon the third. Also, yeah, G-Code, the magic runes of 3D printing were originally designed for CNC machines long before Joseph Prusa invented the third dimension. It's up to the CAM programmer to decide which ones to output and up to the manufacturer to decide which ones to follow. Sometimes they match up, but this is not one of those times. 
we connect wirelessly from the PC because we fancy. We hit go and we send bit number two straight to the shadow realm. The printer was moving too fast, right? And it shouldn't have been doing this. I made sure to set a really slow feed rate, but Snapmaker straight up ignored it. Press F, not to pay our specs, but because there is an F command in our G code, but not in the official Snapmaker G code dictionary. F is not a standalone command, it's a parameter of the G1 command, and Snapmaker remembers the last feed rate indefinitely. I had to drive back to Micro Center, grab another set of tools, and there's our alignment holes. Speaking of the printer remembering our parameters, I then tried to jog the z-axis down 10 millimeters, and it plummeted 254 millimeters through an announcer's table, annihilating bit number three, back to Micro Center. Whenever something's 25.4 times too big, you probably have yourself a unit conversion problem. This is the culprit. The G20 command sets the system to bald eagles, but nothing ever sets it back. I added the G21 command after the job is done so we can go back to metric. But remember, if I cancel early, that line never runs. So, micro center, my old friend. It's nice to shop at you again. I broke a bit on my snap maker, and you're the only meat space retailer who sells spare parts for the kind of maker gear I'm using here, and I have no attention to detail. The next step is to import our Exelon drill file, called one of the Gerbers, technically not, and convert it to CNC jobs. Manually swapping drill bits is a huge pain in the ass, so FlatCam lets us consolidate multiple sizes of hole into one size of drill. You can't mill holes with a drill, it breaks as suddenly as an octogenarian at a yellow light. FlatCam lets us separate the job into drilling and milling, so we can use an end mill to handle all the hot dog hallway situations. This was just the appetizer. It's time to engrave the entree. The flat cam performs isolation routing. It traces out the bare minimum tool paths to isolate each circuit from its neighbor. We need the thinnest possible cut for this, so I'm gonna try a V-routing bit. These come to a terrifyingly sharp point that I didn't stab myself in the back of the hand with. I set up this demo circuit board, processed it, and then basically edited the G-code by hand to try each bit at various speeds, feeds, and depths. This is the standard Snapmaker V-engraving bit, and it has a 30-degree pyramid tip. It's durable, but it's just too clunky for circuits. Snapmaker also makes a carving bit with a 20 degree side angle, 0.3 millimeter tips and dual flutes. The quality was good, but 0.3 millimeters is just too clunky for our traces. This hoo-how bit is similar, but it has an 0.1 millimeter tip, and it actually did decent work, although it was really persnickety about the speeds. We actually broke the tip off. Finally, we have Sane Smart's 15 degree 0.1 millimeter bit with a single flute D-shaped cross section. The engraved lines were thin, but ragged and asymmetrical. They ground the tip down asymmetrically, so it had run out, wobbled around, and the two cutting edges weren't the frickin' same. Why do you do this to me? The reality is that none of these bits are usable. These things cut a V-shaped groove, so the width of the cut depends on how deeply the tip penetrates the virgin copper. This foil that they use for the copper cladding is only 1.4 thousandths of an inch thick, and even with everything tightly fastened and tuned to perfection, the surface just cannot be made flat enough for a consistent cut. Thus, my quest ended in failure, and lacking the ability to make my own boards, I was condemned to a dead-end life of 3D printing content. I'd like to thank our generous patrons, whose support makes episodes like this possible. These gentle souls include... Except... Remember when I broke all those bits? I do every night in a cold sweat. Well, when I ordered those mills, drills, and V-bits, I spotted something extra spicy. I knew it would arrive too late to use in this episode, but I pulled the trigger anyways. Well, my work ethic sucks so hard, I was still working on this script when they arrived. These are ultra-high precision end mills, a mere 0.2, 0.3, and 0.5 millimeters in diameter. The fluted part at the tip is almost too small to capture on camera, but it's still more than long enough to mill traces, and that diameter is exactly what we want. I generated isolation routing, converted it to G-code, ran it very carefully, and now that's what I call circuitry. We pull the PCB off the slot board. I said, we pull the PCB off the slot board. We pull the... 
Damn you past Zach, why did you use carpet tape? Let's flip it over, apply fresh tape, pin down those alignment holes, run the bottom layer, and look how well those drills are lined up. We're at the home stretch. We excavate that diamond end mill from a pile of dust, and we release the board. I fitted the dust shoe for this, because remember, fiberglass dust is hella toxic. Quick wipe, et voila! Snapmaker milled, not PCB. As for vias, the easiest option is to just not use them, but that's just, I found that impractical for most projects. Instead, I got some of these minuscule 0.8 millimeter rivets, and we'll use a wee hammer to peen them over. Tiny peening. It's tougher to solder to this board than I'm used to, since the edges are still slightly ragged, but it came together, and I think it looks pretty legit. From start to finish, the whole process to make one board took about two hours, which honestly is way faster than I expected. We're making a lot of electronics projects, and I'm gonna machine my way from hot garbage to premium garbage, like the dumpster behind a Whole Foods. Of course, thanks to Snapmaker for sponsoring this episode and providing this stunning printer slash CNC slash laser. We are gonna be using this thing a lot moving forward. Their product could actually keep up. I was. A little surprised and impressed. I was suppressed. I put links to this machine in the description along with the workflow, materials, tools, feeds, and speeds that got me the results you see here. I even shared the dust sucker, drilling jigs, and bit organizers, and Snapmaker has some nifty free prints of their own. Why don't you go down there and collect them? I spent an astronomical amount of money on this episode, and without the support of our magnanimous patrons, a router bits wouldn't be the only thing that's broke. A root and toot and highfalutin collab collaborators are Jeremy Arnold Schweddy Veg, Command, Brian D. Swollen Nut, Chuck Faduke Small Dong, and Reagan says in Tarobang. I hid their names somewhere in this episode, less obviously than last time, I kind of phoned that one in, but still pretty freaking obvious. The time has come to thank our lab assistant supporters whose names grow sillier by the day. Don't confuse them with protozoans, those grow cilia by the day. These alleged humans include Azundo, Wielder of Iron, Heater of Shrink, Nathan Johnson, Boulder Creek Yard James, Burb asserted nothing wrong yet, Curb, SXP, it's 2022 and I met my girlfriend at a My Little Pony convention, Talent, Democratic Socialist and a Pretty Righteous Dude, Dash Zack, Michael Roche, Xenforian, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Achalia, I just bought another 3D printer, don't! Trucku, E Pun Man, Caster the Catboy, Brad Cox, DSA, Philip, My Dog is a Bear, Period Plots, Cats, Varka, William Drescher, Isakayev, Mahiro Chan, Desine, On All Levels Except Physical, I Am a Lioness, The Cuttlefish, Good Suck, Rusty Flute, Protagonist, Trans Rights, Burn Duck 3, Taranak, Bob Dobbington, Ethan Gomes, Ashley Coleman, Sir Derpington of Diptopia, Eddie, Lydia K, Victor Vaughn, Bill Schooler, The Antifa, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, Granville Schmidt, One Hand full of beans, TKMK, Powerful CCH, ZACH, the world's greatest drone pilot, Bachrinder FPV, Nino Gansitano, C. Harris, Jim, where John had 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 a better impact on the teacher, Aero Raider, and the positively electric Kevin DeGraff. Thanks for watching, and may you mill the makes that make you millions. I will see you in the future.